Hello. Today we start a new topic which I call separation of variables for second order linear PDEs. We start our discussion of separation of variables on the example of one dimensional heat equation. At the end of the lecture, we will see that there will be necessity of a notion which is called Fourier series to solve the problems that are related to our heat equation in one dimension. Okay, so what is a heat equation? It is an equation for a function u of x and t, which looks like this, where k is a positive real number. Okay. We'll be interested in the solution to this equation in the upper half plane of the x t plane. But actually, we'll be only interested in solution for t greater than zero and x between zero and l. So we are interested only in the solution u of x and t in the region of the xt plane as is depicted on this picture. So this is our heat equation and we want to solve it for t greater than 0 and x between 0 and L where we specify conditions for the solutions at the boundary of this region. So boundary of this region has consists of three parts. First there is an interval from 0 to L at t equal 0 axis and second there are these half lines x equals 0 for t greater than 0 and x equal L for t greater than 0. So what we want from our solution is that the solution will be in the dashed white region of the picture, whereas the solution should satisfy certain conditions that we specify on the red line, which is just our initial line, and on the green half lines, which are just our boundaries of the region. So we want that the solution at x equals 0 and for every value of t greater than 0 will be 0 and we also will be wanting that solution at L for any value of time greater than 0 also is equal to 0. So that's our boundary condition. But we also want that our solution will satisfy an initial condition that at t equals 0 the value of the function u at every point x on this interval is a given function f of x. Okay, so that's our initial condition. So we want that this is for every x between 0 and L. And we also want that this is for every time greater than 0. Okay. 
So the problem that I want to address today is a problem of finding a solution of the heat equation satisfying this boundary condition and this initial condition. And the solution we want to find is in the region bounded by our initial t equal zero interval and the boundaries at x equal zero and l equal zero. So how to solve such a problem? Our approach will be as follows. We don't know how to solve, so we'll be looking for special kind of solutions. We'll be looking for a solution which is of the form of a product of two functions, function x of coordinate x only and function t of coordinate t only. So you're looking for a solution like this. It's not obvious that this problem admits such solutions. But we still want to check if such solutions are possible. And to check if such solution is possible, we should postulate a solution like this and check if these conditions are compatible with our heat equation and with our boundary conditions. Perhaps the first thing I should also mention is that if we have our boundary conditions and our initial conditions, there should be some compatibility between them. In particular, if we just put u of 0, 0, it, will be, it must be first 0 because of that. And on the other hand, it must be f of 0 because of that. So the function f of 0 must be equal 0. And likewise, u of l of 0 must be 0 because of this and must be f of l because of that. So therefore, our function f, which is the function that specify our initial conditions cannot be arbitrary, it should be compatible with the boundary conditions, therefore f of 0 and f of l must be equal to 0. Okay, so let us return to our idea of solving these equations, this equation with these boundary conditions and with these initial conditions by postulating a solution which is a product of x of coordinate x and t of coordinate t. If this is a solution, then we can calculate u t minus k u x x, and this must be zero. But if the solution is in this form, then you will see that it is just x times t dot minus k x double prime time t, where we introduced dot as the time derivative of capital T, and prime, in particular double prime, as x derivative of capital X. Okay. So I repeat, if this is a solution, then the function capital X and capital T should satisfy this relation. And now, of course, we are not interested in solutions for which x of x is equal to 0 and t of t is equal to 0, because it is a boring solution. 
u identically equal to zero. So we don't want such solution, so we assume that both these functions are non-zero in the considered regions. So therefore, if our solution is in this form, we can write that this relation tells us that there is a relation between time derivative of function capital T and the second derivative of function capital X, like this. Right? So, I repeat, if this is a solution, then function capital T and capital X must satisfy this relation. But what this relation means? Note that the left-hand side of this equation consists of a constant k and function capital T and its time derivative. So therefore, this left-hand side depends only on variable t. So this left-hand side is a function of t only. On the other hand, the right-hand side is function of x only. So how it can be or how it can happen that two functions, one of t only and the other of x only, can be equal? This can happen if and only if these two functions are equal to a constant. So let us call this constant negative lambda. So this is what I have said now. I can recapitulate as follows. If I assume that my function u is a solution of my heat equation, and this function u is a product of a function of x only and function of t only, then these two functions, t, capital T, and capital X, should be related by this relation in such a way that each of the functions that are standing on the left or right hand side must be equal to constant. So what is this constant? We don't know. Is this constant integer? We don't know. Is this constant real? We don't know. The safest thing is to assume that this constant is a complex number. So to be absolutely general, let us assume that this lambda is a complex number. Assuming this, we hope that imposing further conditions from our problem, in particular the boundary conditions and the initial conditions, we eventually get the information what this constant is. But for a moment, I have no reason to assume that it is, for example, integer or real. So I assume that this constant standing here is a complex number. So as a complex number, it has its modulus and it's, it has its argument, right? So this lambda, this thing is a positive real number. And this phi here is a number from the interval 0 to pi. So I assume I have this constant here. And now I want to solve these equations. So what are these equations explicitly? If we write them separately, we'll see that this relation here consists of two equations. First, there is equation x double prime plus lambda x is equal to zero. And the second equation says that t dot plus lambda kt is equal to zero, with lambda being a constant. So if this is a solution, to my heat equation, then the function x should satisfy this ODE, and the function t should satisfy this ODE. So from our 
PDE, which is heat equation, assuming that U can be written in this form, we get two ODEs for the function X and function T. So far, we only used the heat equation and using it, we get these ODEs as a consequence of our answers here. Let us now investigate what boundary conditions imply to our postulated solution. So, one of our boundary conditions is that u of 0 t is equal to 0. So, let's, let's write it down. So, u of 0 t is equal to 0, but our u of x of t is x at x equals 0 times t of t. On the other hand, the second, so that's the first boundary condition. On the other hand, the second boundary condition says that u of lt is equal x of l t of t, and it also has to be 0. So in other words, we have that this expression and this expression must be 0, and it must be 0 for every t greater than 0. We don't want that t of t is equal to 0 because we assume that we are not interested in such solutions. So the solution, so the solution to these two equations, which is just a consequence of our boundary conditions, green boundary conditions, tells us that x of 0 must be 0 and x of l must be 0. So let us recapitulate what we have so far. We have just shown that if we postulate a solution to our boundary initial value problem for the heat of equation in the form x of x t of t, then the heat equation implies that function x should satisfy this ODE, that function t should satisfy this ODE. And now the boundary conditions for our problem further imply that the first ODE should satisfy boundary conditions x of 0 equals 0 and x of L equals 0. We still haven't used the initial conditions, but let us concentrate on this, what we have so far. In addition, we also know that this postulate of the solution implies that there exists some lambda, which is a number constant, which we assume to be complex number, to be most general in our considerations, and it always can be written like e to i5. So let us now try to solve the first set of conditions. Forgetting for a while about the equation for the function capital T. We have now to solve this equation, which is a second order linear ODE the with constant coefficient and with this lambda. And we want that the solution satisfies these conditions. We know how to solve second order ODE, which is linear and which has constant coefficients. The solution is usually searched in a form x equal e to omega x, where omega is a complex number. So now for this to be solution, one has to insert this expression for capital X into the equation, obtaining omega squared plus lambda 
equal to zero. Now, lambda is given in here, and omega is a complex number that should satisfy this equation for this function to be a solution to this equation. So, of course, there are two such omegas given lambda, and one can solve this equation for complex number omega given lambda, obtaining So now, from the general theory of linear second-order ODEs with constant coefficients, we know that the general solution to ODE for our capital, for our function capital X, is superposition of two x with two different omegas, which are equal plus or minus i times the square root of modulus lambda times times exponents e to i phi divided by two. So the most general solution of this equation is x equal a times exponents of i lambda e to i phi half times x plus b exponents of minus i right this is a general solution of this ODE where a and b are two arbitrary complex numbers but we don't want to have general solution of this equation, we want to have a solution of this equation satisfy this boundary condition. So let us impose the first condition, which is just this one. And it's very easy. It only says that the number b must be equal to negative a. So now this condition is satisfied for our solution if we just took take b equal negative a and now we have to impose this condition. So this condition says that 0 is equal, we can pull out a from all of this equation and here we'll have exponents of i square root of lambda modulus now, instead of x, we have to insert L. And now there is e to i half, I, I half phi, which is nothing but cosine phi half plus i sine phi half, right? So that's the first thing. And then it should be negative exponent of minus i l and now cosine phi half plus i sine phi half right first we can divide this equation by a because a cannot be zero otherwise our x would be zero so a is non equal zero. Then we can just put one of these things on the one side of the equation, the other on the other side, obtaining something like this. Here we used the well-known properties of the function exponent, that the exponent of a plus b is the same as the exponent of a times exponent of b. So now, if we just look at the equation that we just produced from this equation, which is just consequence of this equation, we'll see that what stays here is purely imaginary. 
as well the thing that stays here that's purely Im imaginary. So exponents of purely imaginary number has modulus 1. Taking modulus on both sides of equation star, we get that e to minus is equal to e to plus. Because, of course, modulus of exponent of something which is real is the same as exponent itself. So now, putting this e to minus thing to the right-hand side of this equation, we will get that 0 is equal to sine of square root of modulus of lambda times L sine phi half. Okay. Excluding the situation that modulus of lambda is equal to zero, we see that this equation is satisfied if and only if sine phi half is equal to zero. But sine phi half is equal to zero only if and only if phi half is equal some integer multiple of pi. Therefore phi is equal to L pi and without loss of generality we can assume that phi is equal to zero. Look what has happened. We introduce this number lambda in here as a constant which was needed to satisfy this equation that the function of t is equal to the function of x. This number lambda, we didn't know what to assume about it, so we considered it in the most general form, namely that it's just a complex number. But now, if you want that our solution to our problem is in this form, is, is, is in the form of, of a product of x times t, then the boundary conditions, which were given here, implied certain conditions on a function x. And one of these conditions was given by these equations, and these equations implied that a constant phi, which was telling us what is our complex number lambda, which was lambda times e to i phi, is actually equal to zero, and therefore this lambda is a non-negative real number. We didn't assume it. We just obtained that lambda must be like this because of our boundary conditions and because we want that our function u, which is a solution, is in the product form. Actually, at a certain moment, I assumed that lambda is not equal to zero. Lambda, in principle, can be equal to zero. I will talk about this situation later. Okay? So far, we only used part of this equation, and using part of this equation, na namely its modulus, we were able to figure out that this constant phi is equal to zero. So now we insert phi equals zero into the equation star and obtain Which means that, again putting this onto the left hand side, that sine of is equal to zero. And this happens if and only if the square root of lambda times L is an integer multiple of pi. Or, which is 
more interesting that lambda, the modulus of lambda, is equal to n squared times pi squared divided by l squared, where n is an integer number. So look what has happened. If we just postulate a solution in the form u x times t, then x must x and then x and t must satisfy these equations, these ODEs for x and t with some a priori complex number lambda. But if we just further examine the boundary conditions, we figure out that this number lambda cannot be anyone. It must be such that its modulus satisfies this. And actually, entire lambda is precisely like that. With n being integer. Right? So, if lambda looks like this, then recall that our omega is then square root of lambda, which is n pi l. And our function x is a times which can be collectively written as 2a to emphasize that our lambda is given in terms of an arbitrary integer n, we will call, we will denote lambda with an index n And the corresponding solution for x also will have index n. And we call this coefficient bn. So here is our solution for our ODE for function x prime satisfying the initial condition x of 0 is equal 0 and x of l is equal l. Now, to find our postulated solution, we have to solve another ODE for the function t. But this function t depends on lambda, and we have plenty of lambdas, so there will be plenty of solutions for the function t. So for every lambda, for every n, there will be lambda of n, and there will be t of n satisfying this equation. So for every n, we now will have an equation for the function t, which we also will give its index n, and this function t should satisfy this equation, which is just equal negative. Simple integration tells us that t n as a function of t now is some constant, call it c n, times times e to negative times t. So taking everything together, given n, we have lambda n, we have xn, and we have tn, and altogether it gives us 
a solution u n of x t, which is just product of t n and x n, calling this constant betwiddle and calling the constant betwiddle n times c n as b n, we get that this solution u n of x t is equal b n times exponent of times sine so what has happened here we looked for the heat equation and we considered that its solution satisfies boundary condition we also assumed that the solution is in the form and then we were able to show that for every n which is integer we can find a solution u u n u sub n which is given here okay now the crucial observation is that everything which stays here, here, and here is linear in U. So in other words, if we have two different solutions satisfying these three conditions, their superposition or their linear combination is also a solution. So in particular, having number of solutions like this with n being 1, 2, 3, and so on, we can build a solution U capital N of X of T being sum over N from 1 to capital N of this solution U, U N of X T, which are sum from N equal 1 to N. So actually, we have plenty of solutions of the heat equation like this with boundary conditions like that. But remember that our solution was not only supposed to satisfy boundary conditions on the left and the, on the right, but also initial condition given by the red curve on the picture that I drawn some time ago. Our problem was formulated on this part of the plane where here was L, here was zero, and here was time, right? And what we already imposed on our solution postulated in the form u x times t, what we imposed, we imposed that this guy satisfy our heat equation everywhere here, and we imposed that it satisfies the boundary conditions, which are just here and here, but this thing, is not yet a solution to the full problem that we have because we still have to force this solution to satisfy initial condition. And this initial condition, remember, was u of x time zero is equal to a given function f of x. So suppose that we have this solution and we evaluate it at t equal to zero. So we insert it in here as un of x of zero 
and we obtain and now we want to find coefficients bn and a number capital N such that this holds for a given function f of x on the interval from x equal 0 to x equal L. So we want this. We check that f of 0 is 0 and f of L is 0 indeed as we would like to have. So there's no problem with that. But it's very optimistic to believe that a given function f of x, like the one here, can be decomposed onto a sum of terms like bn times sine of n pi divided by lx, and that there will be a finite number of such terms. Given a function f, it is very unlikely there will be finite number of these bn's such that this equality holds. So, although by these kind of ansatz, we are able to solve the heat equation everywhere in, inside here, and we can solve it in such a way that the solution satisfies the boundary conditions, when we only restrict to solutions like this, it is very hard to believe that these kind of solutions can satisfy the initial condition. So here, Monsieur Fourier appears and he says, and what if we consider more general solutions than these? What does it mean? He says, OK, what if I just admit that this n can go to infinity? So here is the idea of Fourier. Consider generalized solutions where capital N goes to infinity. Instead of just taking finite linear combinations of the solutions, xn times tn, Consider the infinite sum. And now, skipping the problem of convergence of this thing for a while, perhaps it will be possible to find infinite number of this num of these numbers bn such that f of x is equal to sum of bn sine. So that's the idea of Fourier. Simply consider solutions in terms of infinite linear combinations of these solutions of the form xn times tn. And perhaps for such solutions, you can find bn's so that any function on a given interval can be e expressed as infinite sum of these signs and in this way one will be able to solve the initial value and boundary value problem for the heat equation. We will explore this possibility in the next lecture.